thank you everyone for joining. As you know, this is our series of conversations brought to you by HasGeek and by Scribble Data on making data science work. So some of our past conversations have had the flavor of what does it mean to actually put data science to work, to production, go earn, earn, earn us some money or do something good for us. And uh, after a few of the, the initial conversations around how data science problems are framed, now we are moving into the aspects around being conscientious about data science. And in fact, today's topic is responsible AI. Of course, it's a fairly broad-based term. And uh, thankfully, I've got uh, Suchana to co-host with me. Suchana is uh, an AI ethics expert. Some of you would have seen her in an earlier session with us where she was the panelist. And along with her, uh, as, as our panelists today, we have Yanis and Josh, who I will introduce in just a second. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, Indra. All right. Hi, you're most welcome. So uh, let me start with Yanis. So Yanis is the founder and CEO at Port for Thought. He's based out of Athens in Greece. He has over 17 years of experience in evaluating large scale software systems as a PhD researcher, as a management consultant, and also as a practice leader for an international consulting firm in Greece. Yanis's PhD in computer science is from the University of Manchester. And of course we have Josh as well. So Josh, uh, Joshua Rubin, is a senior data scientist at Fiddler Labs, fiddler.ai. Do check them out if you haven't already. Um, and what I found interesting was that while his PhD from uh, Urbana Champagne is in experimental particle physics, he's extremely passionate about uh, challenging computational problems and particularly enthusiastic about data modeling and semantic matching using deep learning. Um, fiddler.ai, of course, they play uh, deeply in the explainable AI space, which is one of the one of the branches that we will definitely be talking about today as part of our responsible AI topic. So, um, you know what, my first question, just to, to get everybody all warmed up uh, and maybe even a little hot under the collar, what, what is responsible AI in our minds? What do we think of when we, when we are talking about responsible AI? And of course, we'll touch on each of these slivers. Who wants to take this? Um, can I, I can, I can start. Please. Um, yeah, I mean, responsible AI or trusted AI, there are two terms that for me, they are kind of interchangeable, uh, means essentially the, the, the AI that uh, has in first place three things uh, in place with uh, AI that is accountable. So the organizations that are using it, um, they make sure that they can govern their AI appropriately and they do have some risk management properties in place and also that the teams that they design and implement the AI, they follow best practices in order to control it uh, and make it uh, and, 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 and make it manageable, let's say, from a, from a social point of view. And the other two attributes for a responsible AI is the fairness. So we have to make sure that uh, uh, the models that we use and the data that we feed those models they are bias free as much as possible, uh, or we, we consciously know where the biases are and then we, have, we, 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 we devise ways to mitigate this. And the third the property is uh, transparency. So it's how you make uh, AI explainable as you just said and, uh, and mentioned. So which means either we, um, we, we develop AI which is explainable in first place or if we use methods that are not considered as explainable, for instance, deep learning, then we have the appropriate mechanisms in, play to, in place to provide some additional explanations, the so-called post hoc explanations. So these are the three things I have more or less in mind when we talk about trusted or responsible AI. Mm. And of course we can talk about privacy and security and all those things, but in my opinion, these are of course, it related with uh, the responsible AI, but they are mostly properties um, that come mostly with the software itself and the data themselves, not with a combination of software and data where AI lies. That makes sense. Um, the fact that privacy and security are slightly decoupled from this, but still parts of it in some sense. Yes, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Josh, any, any, any thoughts around this? I think that was an, that was an excellent definition. And uh, I think you touched on uh, mo most of the main circles. I, I might just take kind of a, a you know, kind of a, a bird's eye view, a little bit of the whole thing and approach it from just a slightly more kind of philosophical perspective. Um, you know, I think 
AI, you know, changes the way that we do business operations uh, that were traditionally performed by lots of experts for lots of different functions in businesses and in society. Um, and so I think responsible AI has a lot to do with understanding the stake of all of the stakeholders involved um, and making sure that um, everyone has the same sort of, you know, the models are transparent to everyone and everyone has the same controls and inputs that they originally had. Um, so in, in a way, it's not just a technical problem. It's really um, applying a technology that tends to be complicated to um, a lot of different problems that are sort of uh, human or societal or business or customer related problems um, in a new way. And so being able to communicate, um, you know, the reasons why something is behaving the way that it is and being able to put appropriate controls on things uh, is really important. And also there's the time dimension to that, making sure that something that's being used in production uh, continues to perform uh, the way that it was intended. So, uh, you know, at Fiddler, we have a, a sort of a monitoring product, right. um, operationalized ML, um, where we watch things like performance and like bias, um, you know, as a function of time, as the model may begin to get stale or the world may get to change a little bit um, from the original conditions. So we see that as part of it also. I meant to ask, um, why do you think, what forces will it take for people to spend money on this? Oh, <laughs> that's a nice, that, that, that's a good question. Um, I think that uh, let's start looking for the compelling factors. For me, um, to be pragmatic, a regulation or a legal obligation is compelling enough for a company to invest in those things. But on the other hand, it shouldn't, that shouldn't be the case, if you ask me. From a commercial mm -hmm. point of view, I'd like to see organizations who are proactive and they are investing in technology that will render them, let's say, fat or fact ready or fact mm -hmm. compliant, let's say, before a legislation has passed. And there are two reasons for this. First of all, because... Yeah, Yanis, would yes. you mind just expanding that acronym for everybody, please? Ah, yes, you're right. By fact, we mean fairness, accountability, and transparency. These are the, uh, the, this is the explanation. You're right. The point is that uh, and I see it also when it comes to quality aspects for code driven, the traditional software systems. When companies invest in improving their own systems, they're actually investing in improving their own people. So if a company wants to attract talent, a, a good way to show that they appreciate talent and they are investing is also to invest on the behavior of their AI models and the, uh, and the ML models. I mean, recently the United States La those days and also last year there were movements within big tech companies like Facebook or Google from employees that they were thinking that their companies are not acting in an ethical way or that the software they produce is, is, uh, is tricky. So imagine if you are a company who actively invests in those things, uh, how, how, uh, how nice is for your employees and how, uh, let's say, is a very good way to lift the spirits within a company. So I'd say don't wait for the legislation, which is the most compelling reason, of course, but uh, be proactive and see it as a mechanism, first of all, to improve your products and your models, but also to improve your own people. That's my, I, that would be my message. I love that. Um, I remember Suchana and I were talking about one other aspect of this. And in fact, um, when I was linking to this particular talk, I said it, it might be a little bit like sourcing fair trade coffee where there will be a market where ethical or conscientious customers will pay with their dollars to, to, to go to companies that engage in best practices, ethical, responsible AI. Um, the only gap, and this was the conversation that Suchana and I were having, is that in the case of like fair trade coffee or you know, no child labor involved in the manufacture of these products, that straight line is very visible to the consumer. Mm -hmm. In the case of responsible AI, that's a little harder to be able to qualify. Like there are no certifications. Right. Right. Uh, any thoughts around this? Um, if I may just, just jump in here, right? So I think uh, one of the interesting things about AI is also that it has 
and ability to create its own liability as it goes along, right? So, so Yanis was talking about um, the way that privacy and security are somewhat decoupled from AI ethics issues. And, you know, uh, what came to my mind is, for instance, we've seen a lot of AI applications recently, uh, in fact, they've been around for a while, right, that try to predict gender, you know, a user's gender from a bunch of other proxy variables in the data, even if gender itself is obviously being excluded from the data set, right? And so this, you know, this kind of brings us into the territory of, you know, even if you take a few easy or obvious steps to protect people's privacy in, in certain ways, you know, uh, de-anonymization is getting easier and easier and machine learning is obviously one of the best ways to de-anonymize data. Right. So that's one way in which, you know, as, as we go along building like more and more sophisticated machine learning algorithms, we are generating our own liability, so to speak, as we go along. Sorry, I said that makes sense. I was on mute. Um, as part of the, the three, three branches of responsible AI that Jan has introduced right at the start, I'm wondering if we can just go uh, out of order a little bit because I would love to hear Josh talk a little bit about uh, explainability as one of the big branches, uh, given that that is uh, one of the core functions uh, that he looks at day in and day out. Josh, just, you know, maybe something about Shapley values and uh, just introduce us into this world. Sure, sure. Um, so, so there are a number of different mechanisms that one can use to try to, I mean, the, the purpose of explainability is try to expose the underlying sort of reasoning behind why a model is making a prediction that it is. Um, and there are a number of different techniques um, for um, you know, trying to explain a particular model inference. So we call that a point explanation. So a model makes one prediction, you ask the question, you know, why, for this, why, why was this loan rejected, for example? Right? Give, given this set of inputs, why did the model produce this output? The other kind of, uh, you know, another thing you can look at is kind of uh, global feature importance. So generally speaking, what are the kinds of things that a model cares about? Um, so, so, you know, at Fiddler, you know, we like to think of, you know, our offering as sort of um, a bunch of different pieces kind of orbiting in the ML life cycle, you know, kind of starting from, uh, you know, data collection and model creation, and then all the way through to operationalization and production and monitoring. Um, but what we do that I think is special and kind of, I think it, it is a great way to frame this problem is that um, we try to bring these explainability tools into each step of that process. Um, so, you know, for example, in this monitoring product that I mentioned before, um, something may happen in data over time. You may see that your um, prediction accuracy starts to drift, right? You're getting a distribution of results maybe that are different than you have in the past. So probably something in the real world is changing, right? And you don't know exactly what that is. Um, and so that's where we start to leverage these explainability tools. Um, this goes back to this kind of core of, of explainability, which, so, so for us, our kind of go-to first stop is usually a Shapley values based explanation method, um, which is based in uh, a cooperative game theory from the 1950s, um, but has recently in the last five years basically been um, applied to understanding the behavior of machine learning models. So, um, the, the underlying concept there is that if you're trying to split some sort of reward that a team is responsible for, um, uh, sort of fairly among the players uh, for what that team as a coalition uh, has achieved, um, by looking at the way that the, by can reconstructing the team in all permutations and combinations and replaying the game you can figure out what the marginal contributions of each one of the players is. Um, and that nicely includes all of the interactions between the players. So, you know, places where two players perform great together, but are lousy by themselves, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it distributes that reward fairly. When you apply it to machine learning, what's done is that you, the, the game is played by the features that are going into the model and the reward is the difference in the model prediction. And so the idea then is to tr try to attribute um, a change in the model prediction uh, directly to a sort of marginal contribution of each of the inputs. Um, and what's nice about this method is there's a black box formulation of it. So you can apply it to non-differentiable models like um, things like, like decision trees that otherwise you wouldn't have access to like gradient information like you would with a neural net. 
Um, gosh, what else did I need to say there? Uh, to do it exactly, it's very computationally expensive, but there are approximate techniques, things like, like SHAP and LIME that work reasonably well. Right. Yeah. Uh, Indra, if I may say, to complement what Joe said, um, what we see uh, also at, uh, on our end at Code for Thought is that uh, Supply Values indeed provides very useful insights and sparks lots of discussions within an organization. Uh, and, there is an, uh, and there is another technique which is called contrastives, which is, um, let's say, model agnostic, and it can help you understand what are, what are the limits uh, where the decision where a decision can change. So, for instance, for a credit scoring algorithm, if I can, uh, if I, if I, if me, uh, my loan gets rejected and yours is approved, but more or less our profiles were similar, then using contrastives, you can understand what are the, 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 the those tiny variations that change the the algorithm's decision. So, one can guide me. For instance, the, my bank can guide me in order to improve my credit scoring and then get uh, my loan uh, accepted in the next time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to find out. See this explainability. The way that both of you, both of you explained it to me, I can completely see how the how it is tied to the performance of the model. Meaning, if I can explain it better, if I can actually use these Shapley values to predict, uh, to, to take drift and, and to, to figure out the importance of features uh, for, for particular predictions, my model is going to get better. I can, I can completely see that. Um, and there, that aligning of carrots between uh, doing something that is quote unquote right, explainable in this sense, lines up with actually making my model that much better, accounting for changes in the real world. Um, any thoughts on, on how that intersects with fairness? Um, yeah, we've, we, we've seen cases where, I mean, if you, if you get the results and the explanations and then you start uh, uh, inspecting uh, the, those explanations and those supply values, uh, as our experience was that they were within the top 10, uh, top 10 supply values, you can get lots of insights. So if a model has, let's say, 40 features, the top 10 can give you enough insight in order to be able to explain a decision. And there you can, you can if by inspecting them and examining them, you can find out whether there can be potential bias. So for instance, if, uh, if, a, if a woman and a, and a man, they got, they got uh, different results, but the, the decisions were more or less, uh, they were similarities, then you can identify which features played the most important role for each of them and influence the decision. And then you can see uh, if the, there is a bias in the algorithm or not. Uh, or for instance, when we, we used once our uh, explanation technique for uh, image classification, and then we identified uh, in, in several, several pictures uh, when we were experimenting that there were uh, guys wearing makeup and the algorithm has classified them as, as women. And then you can see the bias because, I mean, if you are uh, on TV and you usually you wear makeup, mm -hmm. uh, the algorithm thought that uh, the guy was a woman and not a man, just because of uh, the pixels that uh, indicated the decision were the ones uh, relating the makeup area of the face. That, can I, I'd like to sort of offer something that's in a slightly different direction. Um, if you can identify a place where a model is behaving badly, um, if you can identify an example of an inference where the reasoning is inconsistent with human, human intuition, um, then it's a little bit like finding a bug in code, right? If you're a software engineer and you, if you know there's a condition where your, your code is going to crash or it's going to do something wrong, that gives you a thread to pull on for a region where the behavior might be sort of, um, you know, radically unpredictable, right? Mm -hmm. Um, by creating these explainability windows, by making these models more transparent, um, it, not, not just from the model debugging perspective from the data scientist, but if you're able to provide explanations to somebody who's a domain expert, right? If there's somebody yes. who like a, um, um, a fraud auditor or a chief risk officer who has a, a, an intuition for how the model is supposed to behave above and beyond the data, and they're able to look at a specific example and say, uh, this one's weird. And now mm -hmm. you're feeding me information and telling me the model's reasoning. And this is, I agree, this is weird. Um, you know, that taps into debugability. 
what, what <laughs> nobody wants, data scientists or anybody else in an organization, any of the stakeholders, is a model making inference um, in some regime where it's extrapolating wildly. And, and to come to fairness and bias, when you've identified something like that, um, really all bets are off for how you expect the model to behave. It's, it's that, you know, that, that's, so, so by bringing all the stakeholders into the same room and being able to evaluate the explanations um, with these explainability tools, um, it gives you that sort of, sort of debugging edge that you need to address a wide variety of responsibility related problems. I would, uh, I would agree with Josh. I mean, having all the stakeholders at the same table, that's a rare moment, uh, at least in large corporations, and it's very valuable. When you do it uh, and you get everyone on the same page, um, then you, that, that, that's when you can have impact within an organization and start improving things. And that's what we uh, also experience from our side. You need all the stakeholders on the same table in order to achieve results. And sometimes the explanations, the, the, the same explanations can be presented in, di in different ways uh, to different stakeholders. For instance, for the non-technical people, they, they, you need more visual explanations. You need to visualize them or you need to uh, make them on, to, to transfer them into natural language text. For where, whereas when you present your results to a data scientist and machine learning engineer, you can be as technical as you want. Mm -hmm. So the challenge is then how you can translate uh, your, tech, your, your measurements, your findings into the appropriate way for each uh, group of stakeholders. Yeah. And then also to, to, to have them on the same table, because I, I mean, I couldn't agree more with Josh on this. Sometimes I think that the, the usefulness of our tooling is not the tooling per se, but the, the opportunity that gives to different people to sit on the same table and discuss the results. That's wonderful, especially because it seems to me like a wonderful opportunity to look at, I mean, let's, let's say, for example, a tool was able to spit out something, something about drift where something is against human intuition. Decisions are being made that are counter to human intuition. You use that opportunity to get all of these stakeholders at the table. When I say stakeholders, I mean people who have an interest in uh, the, the revenue that these models are generating, people that are domain experts, people that are social scientists, people that philosophize about this. If you're able to get them there, you are potentially able to create a, an ethical set of principles uh, around which these models should operate. And maybe again, you know, uh, those are constraints. And Sushin, I would love, love to hear something on constraints from you. Maybe those are constraints yes. that make your model work a little bit better. Absolutely. So I, I think, you know, one of the uh, one of the great things that Josh was talking about, you know, the difference between global model level explanations based on future importance and, uh, you know, individual inference related explanations is that both have their place in model risk management and in the entire data science, like the, the life cycle, right? So I think one of the biggest benefits to uh, these global model level feature importance uh, type, type of explanations is that you can implement process fairness. And, and that's important because it lets all the stakeholders have a say on what are the predictors that should even go into the model. So you can sort of intervene at the design or at the solution framing stage and ask, what are even fair predictors for this particular problem, right? Do we really want to use gender to predict this particular uh, uh, you know, target variable? Do we want to use age to predict this particular target variable? So you have an opportunity to, to sort of troubleshoot or debug your model from a fairness perspective, even before you go down the road of a, of a lengthy prototype development process and then you know, kind of learn from a contrastive or counterfactual explanation mm -hmm. that your model is behaving purely. Yeah, but I, you, I think you need both and the local explanations because of that's, I mean, me as a, as a bank client or as a citizen, I'm mostly interested about the decision that, uh, that uh, concerns me. Uh, but well, the global explanation is really nice for all the stakeholders so to understand the global reasoning of the model. But so these things are kind of come hand, hand in hand. And that is why I say you need to decide who, which kind of explanation is more relevant for which yeah. stakeholder. So, uh, sorry, Josh, you were going to say something because I was going to ask about tools. Yeah, I was going to, maybe I'm going to transition into that. Yeah, um, wonderful. So we've been working with, with Hired.com. Um, and so, so to kind of bring it back to kind of tools, um, you know, I, I, th I think an interesting thing that uh, is, is worth differentiating here, particularly for a, a, a mostly data science audience, um, is that we find that it really helps if you can get the explanations out of the, the notebook, right? Out of the data science uh, substrate 
and into some sort of more appropriate venue for uh, you know operationalization. So um, shoot, I had a connection to something something that that Jana said, but it's it's slipped out of my mind. Um, uh, maybe I can prompt a little bit because it seems it seems to me like uh, there's a question from Venkata actually. He says, "What are the major lessons learned during the products that both of you have individually? I mean, been been part of the product journeys." And what I thought I heard you say already is about surfacing explanations into the right format, into the hands of the right people. Uh, maybe from there. Yeah, yeah. So this totally get, this gets to both both Jonas's comments um, about developing the the. Well, uh, developing the right uh, the right kinds of metrics. Um, so, you know, one thing that we so I, as I mentioned, the thing that we we focus on is kind of the opera, operationalization of the of these tools. So, how do you get them out of the notebook? Um, and 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 a nice thing that we found is that as you start to develop tools for other stakeholders, um, there's a feedback cycle about how they want to see these uh, these things visualized, about what are the right metrics for them. So. Um, for the case of Hired.com, is a really interesting kind of case study there. Um, we started working with them uh, around basically constructing a set of data scientist focused um, explainability tools around models that they use to predict the appropriateness of a resume match with a job. Um, what they realized might be helpful is if they could feed some of this information to their curators. So people who really don't have so much to do with data science at all but are ingesting these predictions from these models. So all of a sudden we're at this interface between two groups of people, uh, the data science side, and then, and then someone who's in a kind of a business vertical that has some expert knowledge about, you know, what makes a candidate good or bad, how to coach a candidate on how to change their resume to, or get more experience to be a better candidate. Um, and so we developed, we used the, the API kind of integration with Fiddler, which I think is another one of our, our strong use cases to develop a little dashboard that was specific to the curators. So instead of looking at um, the model predictions in a notebook like the data scientist might, or in the Fiddler platform proper, which is a sort of a web interface, um, we provided a web experience that was um, you know, built on integrations with Fiddler that could be ingested in the workflow that the curators are doing. Um, and one thing they realized right away is when the curators are looking at the same data, not just now with the prediction that says this is a great candidate for this job at a 88% level, but um, here are the reasons why the model thinks so. The curator can use their expert knowledge to um, you know, evaluate whether that model reasoning is sound. We also mm -hmm. think of this as like the human in the loop AI case, right? This is mm -hmm. the best of the human and the machine working together because, um, you know, the explanation can help the curator do their job more efficiently and not miss important details that they might otherwise do. Um, Josh, quick, sorry for the interruption, but you were talking about the, the feedback. I see you've put the human in the loop. The human now has the AI, why the AI did made a particular recommendation. How does uh, the model that was making the recommendation get fed this back next time so that it's making a better? Uh, yeah, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm just there. Uh, okay. Right, and so, so the, the, uh, the important and sort of un, unexpectedly valuable feature is that all of a sudden the curators are then talking the same language with the data scientists. So we provided what they wanted right away, this was like the day two feature, was can I right click this link and drop it in the email and send it to the data science team when I see something weird. And they've never had that power before, right? They were just being fed a prediction for a particular candidate uh, and they were just ingesting that, right? Mm -hmm. Now they're seeing a reason. Um, it's that reason has been sort of carefully sculpted for their purpose uh, in terms of the visualization and the explanation type. They are able to evaluate whether it's weird or not. And then when something does happen that's weird, they can right click a link, describe why this is inconsistent with their expert knowledge and send that to the data science team. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden we have a connection across this um, you know, this wall that otherwise separates two really different business verticals um, where the, the domain expert is able to feed a kind of the responsible, appropriate way to uh, validate the model back to the data science team. And they're not working in a vacuum anymore. And, and from, from what we get back, everybody is really excited by that in ways that they hadn't initially appreciated. Um, we had a similar experience in a project that we did two year, uh, almost a year ago, maybe two years, 
uh, with a high tech company in the United States where they're we're developing a model that identifies potential uh, data leakages within a comp an enterprise wide network. And there the, uh, the, the, the end users of the model decision decisions were the uh, network administrators. So they had to flag a certain user as potentially malicious or not. And, and, and when they were provided with explanations with the top five, top 10 reasons why this particular person is considered as malicious, they, A, they could do the same thing as Josh uh, mentioned. I mean, they could relate to the, to, to the situation and this will make them, was making them more efficient and let's say was augmenting their capabilities and decision, uh, let's say making uh, capabilities. And on the other hand, it was a, a good way to retrain the model because where they, the experts like the network admins were finding inconsistencies and that was a good feedback for the data science and machine learning team to improve the model. Uh, so I would say uh, responsible AI is not only for, for, uh, for aspiring trust to the end user, but also to make them more efficient and augment their, uh, the way they work. That is the one of the quite important takeaways that data scientists should take uh, out of our call today, our, our, out of our webinar, because we need to, to build business cases for organizations to start to continue investing in those things. Yeah. And I think the efficiency uh, is, uh, is a very important reason. I, I, just to underscore uh, that, I think it's a great point. I think the explanation is a first class output of the model. In, in a sense, not, you know, you think about just making a prediction, but there's huge value in supplying prediction plus explanation in any case. Yes. With human so it's it's, it's, yeah, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic uh, point that both Josh and Yanis brought up. And I, you know, I would just love to hear your thoughts on, you know, this notion of surfacing uh, the uncertainty associated with a prediction, you know, along with supplying the prediction to the end user, because explanations do fill that role to a certain degree, but not completely. So your excl explanation can, in some sense, be strong or it can be weak. And that, uh, you know, can enable your end users to think about how much, how uncertain is this prediction really, you know? And it's not always possible to supply um, a sort of a simple confidence score necessarily along with the predictions. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, how you think we can operationalize that. Well, our, our team is working uh, and we're thinking extensively on how we can evaluate the explanation. So I mean, how you can make sure that you can quantitatively at least assess the quality of your explanations. And we read, uh, yeah, several papers, books, and everyone comes down to, you cannot actually do it uh, in a very trustworthy manner. You have to uh, seek for the help of the experts. So the domain, your end users, the curators for, from uh, Hire.com or for the uh, network admins of our clients, for instance. Um, which, which means that uh, they are the human in the loop principle is quite uh, important because it will help you evaluate those explanations. But uh, we continue our research. I don't know if uh, Josh has, uh, they, they, they have any concrete ways apart from a couple of uh, metrics that exist to, to showcase the trustworthiness of their explanations. I mean, there are metrics, but still we would like to give priority to the expert, uh, to the domain expert op experts' opinions rather than uh, the, uh, the, the, the metrics that provide some insights on the quality of the explanation. Yeah, so I think there's I think there's a few tools here, but this may be a case where um, you know the, the the specific approach that you take, uh, you know, depends on on the on the use case a little bit. Um, right, exactly. Things come to mind, right? So um, for for the sh the sort of approximate Shapley values case, um, there are mechanisms by which you uh, Shapley depends on counterfactual examples. Uh, so typically, there's a baseline of some sort. Um, we have a, a formulation of approximate Shapley values that allow us to um, evaluate a prediction with respect to a distribution of counterfactuals, rather than looking at the, some sort of mean expectation of, of an input. Um, and that means that what we actually get out the other end is um, a distribution of explanations. So, so this is a little bit specific to, um, uh, to Fiddler, but we do have a preprint out on the technique um, 
Uh, no, it's, it's, uh, it's really fantastic to hear that you're taking that approach, Josh, because it also puts me in mind of, you know, this idea of data drift. And so how do you, on an ongoing basis, with the underlying data drifting, continue to rely on the quality of your explanations or even the quality of your predictions, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely. So the, 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 one, one interesting piece of that, you know, is we can provide an, an, an error bar, basically a, a confidence interval with um, you know, our explanation, our Shapley explanations. But I, also the space of what's a meaningful explanation is actually much broader than this, this question of like, you know, Shapley values versus contrastive explanations versus right, recourse right. techniques. Um, really a good explanation is what's satisfying to a human being. Um, and so sometimes simple things are really valuable. It, as an alternative to something like Shapley, which gives you a nice, uh, you know, attribution vector that you can show as a tree or a bar chart. Sometimes, you know, in some cases, something like just showing someone the, you know, the three most similar examples that had the same prediction from the model and the three most uh, similar examples that had the prediction from the other class, if you're talking about a binary classifier, if you can just surface those with like similarity search techniques from the, from a training data set, um, that immediately tells you a lot about um, how well supported the prediction is in that area, right? If, if you see three similar examples that are almost identical to the inference you just made, you have a lot of confidence that the model is, um, is well supported by its training data in the regime where the prediction is being made. If you're given three most similar examples that are kind of all over the place and wonky in some way, you know that the model is interpolating or even ex extrapolating and it's, it's not like, you know, the support there is missing and that your confidence should be reduced in, in what the model is um, imputing. Um, so there are different ways to get at those questions. Some of it just has to do with evaluating model support. But I think that the deeper question is sort of like, uh, what's satisfying to humans? And, and there really are a lot of ways to get at that. And it's, and it's, very, it's very domain and uh, user specific. Okay, to everybody, there's a question that I just want to address from, uh, from Andreas, who's uh, listening in. Andreas asks, how can intellectual property issues be dealt with when a company's ML model is shared to do their platforms, to, to check for whether, whether or not their AI model is being responsible? And I think this might have to do with uh, whether it is being audited externally, who is doing the auditing, or if, if it can be done entirely in-house on-prem. I think that's where the flavor of this question was going. Any, uh, any thoughts on that? For us, I mean, uh, we, uh, we are usually signing NDAs with our clients. And usually we have our own, let's say, uh, template, but usually we are uh, flexible enough to sign the NDA of the client in order to respect any IP property and, and so on. For us, uh, let's just say that it's building the technology for, uh, for FAT properties is our core business. So it's our, in our best interest to respect the IP of our client and make sure that it uh, remains intact and we are uh, willing, let's say, to, uh, to sign an agreement with, uh, with them. Um, but I want to make another uh, point to uh, Suchana's comment about the metrics and how we combine them with the explanations. And it is really important uh, when you do monitor things uh, as uh, the, Fiddler, uh, the guys at Fiddler do and uh, as what uh, we are actually doing uh, as well, to, to uh, take them, to, 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 to give some context, to take them within context. So just by following blindly a metric can actually uh, derail your, uh, your reasoning and the insights you get. So you have to always put your metrics into context and in combination to each other. And it's important actually to see the trend of the metric over time because uh, one thing I've seen all those years with uh, software metrics in general, not just for, the, uh, for AI, is that uh, software developers or machine learning engineers, they will try to mimic, to gain the metric. That is why you have to uh, take them into, uh, to combine them, take them into context in order to be able to deduct, to deliver a story that uh, is valuable for everyone and not just f forcing people to game it or to mimic it. Yanis, you just made a point about, uh, and I think Josh had done this earlier as well, about uh, running this over time. Because it's yes. not it's not just like a point in time audit that we that we've been talking about today. I think the sense that I've gotten is that 
everybody who's trying to do responsible AI is best served when this is a continuous parallelly running process of doing the explainability of checking for fairness continuously. It's making your models that much better. So it and sounds- it's like, also, to paraphrase but, it with your coffee example, it's also a matter of sustainability. So you yeah. want to have sustainable uh, coffee production. Also, you want to have sustainable systems and make sure that they, they, the decisions they make through time, they are as fair as possible, as transparent as possible, and as safe as possible for the common good, let's say. Yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I mean, and at least in Europe, uh, sustainability is one of the, uh, and uh, prosperity are uh, very important pillars for the adoption of the AI from the EU countries. So that's how I, I connect them. It sounds to me that beyond the tools that you're building, that this is going to be a, a legitimate career option for people to be involved in uh, in-house teams that are continuously looking at uh, the responsibleness, responsibility of uh, the uh, the AI that is being implemented. Um, any thoughts on emerging career paths? Because we have in our audience today, we we'll, we'll have a bunch of data science folks who are looking at slivers of where in the data science space, either their passions line up or their skill sets line up. So if you can just shed a little bit of light on career paths uh, in this space, that might, might be interesting. Okay, for me, it's, uh, it's an excellent path because you need to combine, let's say, technical skills, but also you need to be uh, to have some social empathy when it comes to social context. So I really love the uh, description of the AI ethicist uh, as, a, as a profession, although uh, it may means a lot of things, so it needs to be more concrete. But uh, let's say if you want to be an FAT or a fact engineer, then you have to have good technical knowledge, which needs to be broad. And then you have to combine also some social skills, some soft skills, if I may say. And uh, I was reading an article that, for instance, explainer of models or uh, let's say an examiner of model decision, decisions will be in a profession of the future. And to me, it makes like perfect sense. And we need more of those people to feel safer, at least. Yeah, I really like that the idea of, of that, that sort of role of somebody who is either an explainer or responsible for doing the work to um, kind of break down the silos a little bit, right? The, the, the person whose job is to adapt tools to the stakeholders outside of yes. data science. Um, Connect the dots. I, say that again? Connect the dots within the organization. Oh. Totally. It takes technical know-how. And like you said, it takes, it takes, um, you know, sort of incredible soft skills for doing the cross-functional work to understand and hear what it is that the other stakeholders in the organization need. Um, and, 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 and to uh, sort of um, intuit what is the most valuable way to deliver the information. What's the right explainability technique? What's the right way to visualize it? What's the most ergonomic way to feed it into their existing familiar workflow that probably isn't the data science workflow? Um, the, the other, so that's, that's, that's one role. That's super interesting to me. The, the, a second role that I think we're starting to see is ML operations. So people who are um, in this monitoring kind of ongoing uh, sort of time-dependent diagnostic dimension, I think we're starting to see that there are data scientists who are maybe not involved directly in model development but who are doing the job of monitoring what's essentially service metrics for a model over time, watching dashboards and being able to do kind of on the spot diagnoses of where a model might be drifting and whether a model might need to be retrained um, in yeah. real time. And, and it's super important because uh, companies stand to save a lot in their bottom line if they can catch model drift before it hits um, their business indicators, right? So companies are on a weekly or monthly basis are watching, you know, profits and losses and those sort of things. And, and, and so they have kind of business people keep an eye on KPIs, but those are trailing indicators to what's happening inside the business. If you can catch model drift in quasi real time before you lost, you know, money for a week window. because the model's been going bad and, and the slow feedback cycle, um, if you can catch that right away and adapt. There are, you know, strong financial incentives for companies to 
uh, be able to monitor what ML is doing in real time. Absolutely. And you just want to bung in with one quick point. The earlier role, right, before the ML ops of the AI ethicist, um, and where you made the point that this person needs to have some amount of technical skill as well as that social, the softer skills, the social cultural context. Because imagine, I can, I can completely see a situation where we, we see drift and then we start chasing down a rabbit hole about the technical reasons why uh, a model is not performing as well as it is. But imagine if the reasons are actually sociocultural or, you know, there has, has something to do with, uh, I don't know, it has something to do with race, something to do with gender, all of those things. And you don't think about that until much later when the horse has left the barn. And by then, the reputation of your company might potentially be in, 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 in bad shape. Whereas you were, you, you were chasing down a technical problem, whereas the signs were all there for you to actually attribute it to something much larger. I think if I may weigh in, you know, in, in my experience, what I found is probably the most single most valuable skill that an AI ethicist brings to the table is their ability to bridge different domains and to translate between different domains, right? So, you know, in the, in the same day, in the same conversation, you might be talking to a lawyer and you might be talking to an ML engineer, you might be talking to a product manager and, and your, your entire effort goes into aligning them and making sure that the values and concerns they're articulating map onto something tangible, some metric that can be tracked somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a, that, you know, that, that's a very non-trivial skill to acquire. And I think uh, we don't we don't we don't see AI ethics curriculums in place yet in computer science programs that would you know uh, kind of build that kind of a skill. Mm. Yeah, um, there's a question uh, unless some, somebody wants to bung in, but there's a question uh, where we are being asked: How do you see the landscape emerging over the next year in terms of a few things, a few prompts, laws, business interests, jobs? companies. So I think we talked a little bit about jobs, potential career paths. Uh, we talked about uh, a little bit about uh, business interest, why it might make sense for them. From a laws perspective, do you see anything on the horizon? I mean, yes, we have data protection, data privacy, but nothing, I, not that I'm aware of in terms of responsibility. In, uh, in, 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 in Europe, at least, there was supposed to such legislation to pass by uh, Q3 or Q4 2020, but due to COVID-19, this has been delayed and now it is expected to be uh, voted or passed in the EU Parliament, I think Q1 or Q2 2021. So I'm optimistic that this will be, uh, this will be uh, the case. In the United States, the best of my knowledge... Sorry, Yanis? May know. What, what type of law, what flavor of law? About responsible am I? Uh, responsible uh, AI? It is uh, for the AI, uh, AI adoption and part of it is also responsible AI. Um, which oh, so, so many loopholes. Uh, yeah, but it prescribes things like fairness or transparency or accountability, so they are in the mix. In the United States, I do know about the Algorithmic Accountability Act which has been it's okay. under discussion since 2018 or 2019, if I'm not mistaken. But I think there is no lots of progress since then. But I'm optimistic, at least, that in the European Union in 2021, there will be some legislation. Wow. So I'm optimistic that this will uh, start uh, taking off. All right. I think we are, we are in the beginning of the phase, not... Uh, yeah, we are... A little bit before the beginning. Mm. Um, I just wanted to touch upon one other point. Uh, Suchana, feel free to, to jump in if, if you have some other questions. I wanted to ask a little bit about um, the potential for further tools to be built out. We, we talked at one point about imagine being able to create an ethical layer, a layer of principles by which a company operates that might interface with the laws themselves, but that might also have to do with the culture of the company. The, you know, a company can say, don't be evil, but then let that uh, sort of uh, erode over a period of time. But imagine if you bake that into technology, do you think that in this world of responsible AI, beyond the tools you all are thinking of. Uh, there is a market for more tools. There is uh, a need for other flavors of tools. And if so, what comes to mind? I, I think, yeah, there, is, there, there will be uh, room for more tooling. Uh, already there are, there are lots of open source tools. 
and uh, in the discussion that we uh, that we had before um, we mentioned that uh, this kind of tooling is an enterprise scale tooling so that is why there is room for several ideas and several uh, tools in the mix um, for instance you can differentiate yourself uh, using some benchmarks so some mm -hmm. comparisons or you can provide some uh, very cool visualizations that your competitors do not provide. So I think that uh, uh, I'm quite optimistic about this type of market effects. It's a niche market, of course, but I'm optimistic that uh, there will be more tooling. And actually, we need more tooling. I don't think that uh, just uh, two startups like Hot uh, for Thought or Peter are enough to fill the, to fill the void. And, uh, and there is already some critical mass of open source libraries that you can use, actually, for your own, uh, you can use them and you can uh, build your, you can create your own mix and your own uh, flavor of, uh, of tooling. So yeah, there, uh, yeah, there is uh, plenty of room for good ideas. So, so I'm, I'm sort of optimistic in, in, in the sense that I think right now we live in a world where everyone's riding horses on the street and a few people are gonna start showing up with well, automobiles, right? Uh, and I think as there start to be a few visible examples of really great explainable AI, there's going to be a rush of companies who have lots of incentives to see what other people are doing or other companies are doing. Um, it, it's sort of like the, in, in the hired case, right? Like the exact solution to that problem wasn't obvious when we started, um, but there was kind of a pop at the end when suddenly people realize like this, this is a, a really valuable new workflow to us uh, that we didn't quite know how to describe or to ask for. So, so I, think, I think that we're maybe at the beginning of people seeing examples of things that work really well and bring business value that they didn't realize that they needed. Um, you know, and that there'll be you know, an increased amount of kind of clamor for, for great tools. I mean, particularly as people who are kind of maybe feeling a little bit powerless in like um, executive roles or governance roles or ethics roles at businesses are realizing they really can have a voice and some visibility into what this kind of scary but valuable technology is doing. Like as soon yeah. as those mechanisms become, start to become visible um, in other use cases, I think a lot of companies are going to want that. Yeah. And in fact, in your analogy, the, the, the horses on the streets, um, I'm reminded of New York and until they saw the automobiles, they were just making do with the fact that all of these horses were letting loose all of what they ate for lunch all over the streets. And that is just a, that was just a consequence of dealing with the kind of AI that did not think through what could be better. So uh, I, I like that analogy. There's, and I think that there is a lot of room for improvement uh, and that in fact, as I love saying time and time again, that all of the interests of our capitalistic society can still be aligned where uh, not just that models can become better at doing the jobs that they're meant to do, but also with a little bit of care and thought and a little bit of publicity, um, consumers can start to demand that the companies that they are buying from be able to showcase how responsible and how fair they are in the way that they tackle their AI, that they use and employ their AI. I think building off of, uh, you know, what, what Indra was saying, I think one space in the tooling domain that I would love to see maybe more tools or more startups emerge is sort of the time evolution of incentive dynamics, if that makes sense. So uh, one example that comes to mind is the ML Fairness Gym, right? Where what you do is you let a bunch of reinforcement learners play out over time to see what happens if you make an ethics policy intervention, right? Let's say you attempt to make your ML algorithm fairer over a period of time. And you set certain fairness metrics as constraints, and then you let that play out over time, and you see how perhaps other kinds of unfairnesses accumulate in the system because you cannot simultaneously optimize for all kinds of fairness, right? So as these discussions get complex and more nuanced, it would be really interesting to see if other players emerge in this space where you're looking at the time evolution of your of your fairness interventions. I love that concept, an ML fairness gym. Uh, very nice. Wonderful. Um, I, we are at, at five minutes to the hour. So uh, I would love to take a couple of minutes to just uh, 
thank everybody for for having attended. Uh, this has been this has been fantastic. And of course, as usual, for everybody listening, if you visit hasgeek.com slash fifth elephant, which is Hasgeek's uh, data conference that they've been running, one of the premier data conferences uh, in the country in India, um, you can visit hasgeek.com slash fifth elephant to see videos of past sessions and session summaries, including this one. And I also want to mention that uh, both Suchana and Yanis will be putting out notes that will be visible on hasgeek.com and uh, Hasgeek will be making an announcement about when those notes are available. So, so just before we sort of close this, you know, um, are there sort of any open challenges or, or you know, any, any um, sort of open big questions in the field of responsible AI that you think isn't being addressed or that you would love to see people working on? Uh, that's a nice question. I mean, it's like, uh, what do you want Santa Claus to bring you in Christmas? What kind of gift you want? Uh, <laughs> for me, uh, I mean, you said yourself things, how we can evaluate in a very trustworthy uh, way the explanations. So how good is our transparency mechanisms? That, that is something that you really like to see, for instance. Yeah, that's good. I, I, I'd like to see better tooling around um, fairness and making uh, sort of balancing fairness interests more accessible to domain experts. Because I think, I think it's challenging when we get asked, you know, can you give us a fairness monitoring product? Uh, it's so specific to the use case, you know, yeah. if yes. we can create a mechanism or engage our customer in a mechanism where they can, um, yeah, and also this piece of themselves. possible fairness metrics is so large and there are so many kind of tensions and trade-offs and sort of, you know, sure. most of them are not satisfiable simultaneously. So, so I hear you. Yes, yes it would be so good task, to have that. So task specific. Yes. Sorry, guys, I cut out, but uh, back here for, for the wrap-up. And I, I like the last bit of what I heard as well. I think those were closing thoughts. Yeah. Uh, wonderful. So uh, for everybody listening, uh, if you have questions that you didn't get around to asking right now, you can always visit the HasGeek page um, under Making Data Science Work. And you can add your comments in there, which we will be sure to pass on to Yanis and Josh. You can also find them on LinkedIn, Yanis Canelopoulos and Josh Rubin. You can find uh, HasGeek, obviously, on all of the platforms. And uh, both Suchana and I, uh, Suchana, of course, is a co-host, is co-hosting for the first time with us today. And uh, this was Indra from Scribble Data. We make a feature story. You should check us out sometime. With that, I will say goodbye to everybody that joined. And thank you so much to, to the panelists and to my co-host. Host. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Scribble Data and Hasgeek. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care.